many know we serve a great, great God? Let's just give him a praise offering right now because I just feel God moving in this place right now. He is speaking to you women right now. You came here asking for an answer and God is answering. I know he's here. You can feel his presence and it's just a blessing to be able to all be in the presence together as women of God and just comfort, support each other and lift each other up. Um, this conference, it's been a blessing of a time. Um, we had our amazing speaker last night, um, another amazing speaker this morning. We're going to get into our last speaker to close this out. Um, she is powerful. I was able to first hear her at She Rises um, back in June, and God broke me. He broke me when, you know, he had me there, and I, I went. You know, we come to these things. We come looking for answers. You're lost. You're confused. You don't know, you know, you don't know the path God wants you to direct you on, and you just call to him. And when you least expect it, he answers you. And he reminds you, I'm here. You're my child. I am going to lift you up and direct you in the path I want you to be directed in. Um, so listening to her message really broke me. Listening to her message last night broke me again. She just has a powerful anointing over her and you can tell she loves God she has a fire for God she does amazing amazing things um, if you don't know she helps um, with She Rises alongside Holly Wagner who is um, the founder of She Rises um, she co-leads it with her and oh my oh my oh my this June was my first She Rises and I am looking forward for many more to come. And this is our first GEMS conference. And I'm looking for many, many more to come from this GEMS Renew conference. There's many more to come. Um, she also has a book, a devotional book. If you guys haven't seen it, if you ladies haven't seen it yet out in the lobby, it's called Hey Babe. And I... I just, I am gonna go back there. I haven't had the time yet to run back there and get a book, but I'm going to get one before I leave. Um, she was doing signings um, in the break. If you didn't get a chance to have her sign your book, she will do signings again at the end of this session. Um, she is a wife and a mother. She pretty, she shared a little bit um, last night in her message. She's been married. Um, for 23 years, 20, something like that. <laughs> She's been married for 23 years. She has two beautiful daughters, um, and she is about to close this out. God spoke to her and told her, you need to speak this to the women, and I know she is going to close this out strong. So if you can please help me welcome Pastor Megan on up. All right, all right. Hey, before you sit down, I want to take a minute and pray for you. What a powerful time we've had together so far, right? And um, thank you, girls, every one of you, for sharing your story, for being courageous, for being brave enough to stand on a platform, which is intimidating to anyone. But um, when you're telling the details of your story, it can be so challenging. And I just want you to know I'm so proud of you. And, and that's how you use your voice. And that's, that's the actual way that we show the world who Jesus is. It's who I was before Jesus and then who I am now. And that's, that's the power of story. And so thank you for being so willing to tell your story. It was beautiful. And I, I'm proud of you. I want you to know that. Yeah. Yeah. And can I just, can I just take a minute? I'm going to pray for us, but I'm going to ask you to do something, okay? Um. We all, we all live and lead busy lives. And um, you showed up, you carved out time in your weekend to be here to receive something from God. And that's why you're here. You wouldn't be here if you didn't come for that. There's, there's other things going on. And um, 
I just want to challenge you. We've had some just beautiful moments with the Lord and times of worship. And I just had this picture in my head of a posture to receive. Um, you know, if any of your parents and you have kids, anybody have kids? Okay, then you're going you're gonna to get this. You know, when you do something and you, you have like the greatest gift that you want to give to your kids, like you want to surprise them with something so big, you're so excited about it, right? Like you just know, what, like you've got this surprise and you're ready to give it to them. And if you're like, hey, child, <laughs> I've got something for you. And they're like, kind of makes you change your mind, doesn't it? Well, forget about that. I'll keep it for myself. Uh, God's not like that, thank goodness. But I do want to challenge you. If there's still something that you're holding on to, if there's still something that's keeping you from opening up your heart to all that God has for you, this is our last moment together. So can I, can I tell you that posture matters? The reason you look around the room and people raise their hands during a time of worship, they, their hands are lifted. They're not asking questions. They're, they're simply posturing themselves to say, God, I surrender. I surrender my heart. I surrender my will. Maybe they're simply saying, God, I need you. That's what my little kids did when they were tiny. They lifted their arms. I need you, Mommy. I need you. And maybe it's that. It's surrender. It's I need you. It's a posture to receive. If I came to give you a gift, you would have to extend your hands to receive it, right? And so that's the reason when we worship, we actually posture our body to receive from God. We're saying, God, I need you. If you have it, I want it. That's why I'm here. So I want to take a minute and pray for you before we dive in. And can I just ask everyone in this room, would you just extend your hands or lift them high and posture your heart along with your body to say, God, right now, I'm here. For these last few moments that we have together, God, I'm here. I need you. I need a word from you. I need something that I can walk away with and go home with that's going to give me the strength to continue to walk out my faith. God, I need you, and I'm here to receive from you. And God, as we as daughters stand before you with our arms extended, ready to receive, God, I thank you that your word promises us that you will not leave us disappointed. God, I thank you that your word promises us that when we draw near to you, you draw near to us. So God, I pray over every woman in this room right now in the name of Jesus, that over the next few moments that we have together, God, that you would speak the exact word that she needs to hear, that you would convict her spirit, that you bring peace to her heart. God, that when she walks out of this room today, she would walk out with a confidence, God, that she has heard from you. And God, I thank you that you're equipping her for all that you've called her to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Yes, God, that's worth a hand clap. Come on. God's doing something. He is. So why don't you go ahead and grab your seats. I'm going to dive straight in today because you guys have been drinking from a fire hydrant. You've been just filled up with so many incredible words. And here's what I know. I have to believe that God has a specific word for you right now. I came prepared to speak at this conference two times, and I prepared two messages. And this morning I sat downstairs in my hotel and had some coffee and just a little bit of breakfast, and I was praying over the message, studying the message, and I walked back upstairs, and sitting on my, um, my dresser was the gift that you guys received last night. There was a little bag that had a, a ring and a keychain in it. Now, Pastor Veronica, I don't know if this keychain says the same in everyone's bag or if it says different verses. But for me, um, this was a kind of game changer because I looked down and I saw it, and I felt like the Spirit of God said, you need to preach a different message. And, um, and so I'll share with you what my keychain says in just a moment because um, it's a scripture that goes along with what I, I would call my, my life message. And, um, and I felt like God just shifted gears. So 
your tech team got a, a surprise with new notes, and I don't know if they're going to be on the screen. And guys, if they're not, no worries. But if they are, you're a rock star back there. You're a you're a stinking rock star. Good job. So uh, I I'm just going to share a message that I believe must be the Holy Spirit wanting to bring it to you because to change a message like that, uh, I don't normally do that. So um, we're going to dive straight in. And what's really fun is uh, Pastor Veronica talk to you about some gems in the scripture today. And uh, I'm going to dive into one of the same chapters of the Bible that she taught you from. And um, you're going to meet another gem. And we're going to recap a little bit about one that you spoke about. But this is found, if you're following along in the scripture or taking notes, it's found in the book of Mark chapter 5, verse 21. And we're just going to dive right in. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. And then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Now, let me just set the stage here for you for a moment. Jesus has just arrived in a, in a city. And he's been met by a man named Jairus. And the scripture tells us that Jairus was a ruler in the synagogue. And we don't know what his job was exactly. We just know he worked in the synagogue, which would be like the house of God, the place that people went to worship. And this man, Jairus, was in a desperate situation. He showed up to find Jesus because he was in a desperate situation. His little 12-year-old girl was at the point of death. And he came running to Jesus and says, can you come with me and do something about about this. And Jesus replies, yes, I'll go with you. And they go. And the thing that I love about this story is I'm looking at this man, Jairus, and I'm like, how did he know to go to Jesus? And the thing about scripture that I love is there's some things that are not fully explained to us, but we can speculate based upon the other information that we have. So what I do know is that Jairus was a ruler in the synagogue of Capernaum. And Capernaum was the place where Jesus did many of his early miracles. So if you've heard about those, when Peter's mother-in-law was sick with fever and she was down and out and Jesus went to Peter's house, he healed Peter's mother-in-law and she got up and made him dinner. That was something crazy that happened in the scripture. Same place in Capernaum is where Jesus actually healed the 10 lepers. And he told the lepers to go and show themselves to the priest so that they could be pronounced clean. And I just have this theory. Again, it's not in the scripture, but I just wonder, is it possible that that day that Jairus was on duty in the synagogue when the 10 lepers showed up? Is it possible that he was there and he was listening and he was hearing them talk about this man named Jesus and tell their story about the fact that once they were sick, the prognosis was death, and yet Jesus came along and they were healed? Is it possible that Jairus was there in that moment and when his desperate moment of need came up, he immediately remembered and said, I've got to go and find Jesus? Is it possible? I don't know. What the real story is there, but what I do wonder for you is, is God your first response or your last ditch effort? Where do you turn when crisis hits? Where do you turn when stress is overwhelming? You know, I don't know how you respond, but I know for me, if I'm honest, I immediately go into problem-solving mode. I'm a pretty good problem solver. In fact, that's one of the things that I pride myself in. I can come up with solutions to a lot of problems. And I am a great planner. Do I have any planners in the room? I make really good plans. I think they're pretty awesome. I make great plans. And so I immediately go into planning and problem-solving mode. My husband and I are very similar. We both tend to thrive under pressure. Like when things get crazy, it's like, let's go, right? Do I have any friends in the room who just respond like that? You're like, let's go. And so I tend to go into problem-solving mode. The problem with this is my problem-solving, my planning 
is often my attempt to control the situation. Proverbs 16, 9 says, in his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. You know, I want to tell you an embarrassing story that I'm actually, I really am embarrassed of. And to be honest with you, I, I can't say that I've actually told my mom about this story yet, but um, years and years ago, my mom had given me um, one of my grandma's rings. And uh, it wasn't something I wore, but it was something I held on to. It was special. It had meaning and value. And when my husband and I moved with our kids out to California to start the movement church, we moved to a place where we knew no one, and we really didn't have anything. And so we were blessed by our church in Arizona who supported our salary for about a year when we moved out and got ready to start the church. But let me just tell you, California, you guys know this, is expensive. And we were in a position where we were having to like put cre our, our groceries on a credit card. Like we were just trying to do what we could do to start the church. Well, come December, Christmas is coming. And Christmas is coming, and I don't know if I have any friends in the room, but I love Christmas. I'm like Buddy the Elf. Like, I love Christmas. I love everything about Christmas, and I like to go big at Christmas. We make, my kids, we have traditions that we will do for the rest of their lives. We love Christmas, and I like to make it so special for my kids. And we hit the month of December, and I realized, how am I going to do Christmas for my kids? At this time, Brooklyn was about eight, and Avery was three, and I'm trying to figure out how are we going to make Christmas memorable. We don't have any money. I don't even know how to do Christmas gifts, and I was stressing out about it, and I did what I always do. I went into problem-solving mode, and I came up with this great idea, and I took my grandmother's ring, and I visited several different pawn shops, and no one was really willing to buy it from me. And then I met with this woman in a Burger King, guys. And she offered me $400 for this ring. And I thought, you know what? I can do Christmas with $400. I can make Christmas pretty amazing. So I sold the ring in a Burger King to this woman for $400. And I felt pretty proud of the plan that I had made. Fast forward about one week. And I was out in our little neighborhood getting my mail out of the mailbox. And I opened the mailbox. And inside of the mailbox was a, an envelope addressed to both Carrie and myself from a pastor in Alabama. And I opened up the envelope and I read the letter and it said, Carrie and Megan, we're so proud of you for taking the bold risk of starting a church. And we know how hard it can be. So what we want to do is bless you and your family for Christmas this year. This is not for the church. This is for you personally. And I'm standing frozen in my kitchen reading this envelope, and I lifted it up and looked at the check that was inside. And it was a check for $2,500. And immediately the Spirit of God just convicted me. That was in the mail. But because of my own need to control a situation, when I felt desperate and out of control, when I didn't know how to make things happen, I didn't stop to pray and say, God, what would you have me do? I just immediately came up with a plan. And I'm so embarrassed to tell that story today, but many of you can identify with that. What's your first response when crisis hits? Do you look to God or do you look to yourself? See, what if our first response could be just to run to the feet of Jesus? Some of you in this room, you're not planners, but you are whiners and complainers. I know that's painful, but if you're honest, like when problems rise and stress hits, like you have to talk about it to everyone. You have to tell everyone how bad it is. The language is this victim language. Why me? It's always me. It's always like this. And you find yourself in that posture. Some of you just like to sit in your feelings. Your feelings kind of people. And, and your immediate response is, <laughs> it's hopeless. You know who you are. It's hopeless. You know, feelings are horrible leaders. 
They were never meant to be leaders. They're meant to be followers. And some of you, when crisis hits and stress is overwhelming, you just, you try to do anything you can to numb out, to like pretend it's not real. But what our real response needs to be is to run to Jesus. I love what Isaiah 43, 2 says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame will not consume you. And this is a promise from God for you and for me. Back to Jairus. He did the right move. He went to Jesus and Jesus says to Jairus, Jairus, I will go with you. Jairus, I'll go with you. And so we pick up in the scripture in Mark chapter 5, verse 24 through 34, and we run into the gem that Pastor Veronica talked about earlier today. It says this, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better, yet she grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power had gone out from him, immediately turned to the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, I just imagine the disciples had to have had a little attitude here in this moment, right? Like, do you see the crowd of people pressed in around you? Like it said they were thronging around him. I don't even know what that word means, but they were pressed in around him. And yet you're asking who touched you? But the woman, knowing what happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. You see, one of the things you'll find all over scripture is that some miracles happen in a moment. Some require a fight and some are found in the waiting. So see, this woman is someone for another Bible study another day. You already heard about her this morning, but I just want you to capture what happened here. Because of her fight, because of her faith, she was healed. Some miracles are found in the waiting, though. And here we have Jairus. And Jairus was on his way with Jesus to deal with the greatest crisis that he had probably ever faced. His daughter was at the point of death. And Jesus himself had said, I'll go with you. And they were on their way to Jairus' house so that Jesus could do a miracle for Jairus, and yet he was interrupted. And I just imagine in that moment how Jairus must have been feeling. He's standing there, probably like tapping his foot, probably a little antsy, probably, probably a little excited because in that moment he had to be thinking, okay, okay, this is awesome. He can do miracles. I just saw it with my own eyes. But he also had to be thinking, okay, but what about mine? What about my miracle? What about my need? As he's standing there and he's waiting in that moment, he had to have been struggling with, okay, this is awesome, but also, God, what about me? He was waiting. And I think in the waiting seasons, every single one of us is susceptible to comparison. Have you ever watched the miraculous unfold in someone else's life? Have you ever been praying for or believing for something that just seems to fall into the laps of others? Maybe it's a child. Maybe you've just been desperately praying for a child and You've tried so many things, but nothing has seemed to work, but yet everyone around you seems to be having a baby shower. And you're invited, and you're supposed to show up and celebrate, but at the same time, you're waiting for your miracle. And you want to celebrate their miracle because, wow, God, you're amazing, but yet you're in the middle of the waiting, and it's a little bit hard to not get frustrated or disappointed as you're waiting for yours. Maybe it's for a spouse. You've been praying for and believing that God's going to bring the right person into your life, and yet you find yourself always being invited to be a bridesmaid or to a wedding of somebody else and hearing their miraculous story, but yet you're waiting on yours. 
Maybe it's for finances. Maybe you've been praying for provision, for a house, for whatever it might be. But constantly around you, you find everyone else seems to be celebrating their miracle, but you're still waiting on yours. Maybe it's for healing. And you hear my friend get up and share her story about how God healed her body. And you celebrate that because God is good. But in the meantime, you're waiting on God to do the miraculous in your body. And you find yourself waiting. And I just imagine that Jairus was right here. You know, Theodore Roosevelt said, comparison is the thief of joy. And I would take it another step and say, comparison is the root of all inferiority. Let me say that again. Comparison is the root of all inferiority. You see, if you compare yourself to someone else, the way you look, the life you live, the spouse you have, the child that you're raising, if you compare your life to someone else, let me just tell you, friends, you will always feel inferior. Always. And I just imagine that this is where Jairus was. He's just comparing. When you, when you compare yourself to people, the soundtrack of the enemy in your own mind can begin to make you question your own worth and value. It can begin to make you say, what's wrong with me? Why not me? And unfortunately, for those of you who've been raised in the church, oftentimes what happens is a works-based gospel begins to set in. I must not be doing enough. I must not be praying enough. There must be sin in my life. I must not have enough faith. And can I tell you there is nothing further from the truth? There's nothing further from the truth. I shared with you last night about losing my dad, and he was 56 years old. He battled a rare form of cancer for three years. And he was the only person in the world who had it in the place where he had it. There was like 50 people in the world with this type of cancer, and, and we prayed, and we believed for the miraculous. We believed in a God who does miracles, and I still to this day believe that God is a miracle-working God. And we prayed with great faith that God was going to heal him, and we were going to tell the stories about it to the nations. And God did choose to heal my dad, but not in the way that I planned, not in the way that I wanted. He healed him in heaven and not here on earth. And I remember I wrestled in that moment with my faith. I wondered, was my faith not strong enough? And it took me a long time to go through a journey of understanding that faith is not about the outcome that I want. Faith is about the journey with Jesus. It's about walking with Jesus. It's about Jairus saying, I'm going to go on the journey with Jesus. It's not about the outcome. It's about the journey. And the problem is comparison robs us of that understanding because it makes us think that there's something wrong with us and everybody else has it better. You know, some of you are feeding your soul with an endless scroll. Have you ever been to a buffet? I don't go there anymore. <laughs> because here's the thing, and we all know this. If you go to a buffet, you can get anything you want to eat. Chinese food, Italian food, salad, pizza, dessert. You can eat anything you want to eat at a buffet. But you know what happens after you stuff your face at a buffet? Anybody? You get sick. You get sick to your stomach because nobody was meant to consume that much food or that many types of food in one setting. And I'm just afraid that today we've been indulging in a buffet of social media. You know that when you're looking at your phone and you're scrolling, that that scroll is called your feed what are you consuming? What are you eating? Because one of the greatest places I believe that today we struggle with comparison is through social media, looking at the highlight reel of everybody else's life and wondering why my life isn't the same. So can I just challenge you, if that's been a struggle for you, perhaps it's a season to, to take a wait, take a break, because we got to guard our hearts in the waiting season. we got to guard our hearts as we're waiting on the promises of God. Let's go back to Jairus for a moment. We're going to pick up in Mark chapter 5, verse 35. And it says this. 
While Jesus was still speaking, so he's still talking to the woman who's just been healed of the issue of blood. While Jesus was still speaking, there came news from the ruler's house, some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus turns and he says to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except for Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw the commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. They used to bring in professional mourners at the time when someone would pass away, and they would come and cry, and they would mourn for the family. And it says, Jesus, when he entered, he says to them, why are you making all of this commotion? Why are you weeping? The child is not dead. She's only sleeping. And they laughed at him. You know, I love this moment with Jesus. Because here they are, and Jairus has gone to him desperate. Jesus was the first response. Jairus has been standing there having to battle the lies of comparison that every single one of us have to battle at some point or another. And Jairus is waiting on his miracle, and all of a sudden, news comes that the miracle's just not going to happen. And I wonder how many of you have been there where the facts that you're looking at just make what you were hoping for seem completely impossible. And Jairus is standing there, and can you imagine how he must have felt in that moment? Just like like the defeat that he must have felt. Like maybe, Jesus, if you'd just been a little faster, Maybe if we hadn't stopped so long with this woman, maybe if we just moved a tiny bit faster, maybe then I would have been able to experience the miracle, but now it's all lost and it's gone. And I imagine that the heavy weight and cloud of hopelessness was just trying to settle in over Jairus' life. And I wonder how many of you have been there just under the cloud of hopelessness because the facts that you're looking at make you think that what you were believing for or dreaming for or praying for just seems completely impossible. But Jesus himself turns in that moment and he looks at Jairus and he says to him, do not fear, only believe. That's what's on my keychain here. Do not fear, only believe. You see, when my experience doesn't match my expectation, disappointment sets in. When my experience doesn't match my expectation, fear can become the loudest voice in my life. And that must be how Jairus was feeling. But here's what I know. Some miracles happen in a moment. Some require a fight. But some are found in the waiting. And Jesus looks at Jairus in this moment to stir up his faith. And he says, no, do not fear. Only believe. You know what's really interesting about this statement in the scripture here? The New Testament in the Bible was written in Greek. And in the translation, translating the Greek to English, translators adjusted the tenses of the words to conform to modern usage. You see, Greek authors, when they were writing, they used to use the present tense for the sake of heightened vividness. But translators felt like it was best to change the historical present tense to the verbs in English with a past tense. Now, you might be like, why are you giving me an English lesson right now, Megan? In this scripture, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. The actual Greek translation of the word is says, which means that the Bible your Bible, your word of God that is living and active and powerful and applicable for your life today actually reads for you and for me, Jesus says right now, today, in your moment, in your place of crisis, in your place of disbelief, Jesus says, do not fear, only believe. He says it today, right now. It's for you and it's for me. Do not fear, only believe. So I just want to ask you ladies, what have you stopped believing for? Where have you been met with facts and disappointment and you've just lowered your expectation so that you don't have to be disappointed again? 
Because I believe that before you leave today, God wants to get your faith up again. You see, we tend to have this response, it is what it is. But faith says, it is what it is, but it's not what it seems. It is what it is. But it's not what it seems. You see, Jesus then goes with Jairus, and he shows up at Jairus' house, and he's not phased by what everyone's saying. He gets there, and all of these people are mourning, and they're crying, and they're wailing, and they're talking about the death of this little girl, and Jesus just kind of walks right through all of them. He's not phased by what people are saying, and you need to know this today because I don't care what words have been spoken over you. I don't care what people have told you. I don't care what the diagnosis has been. What I'm here today to tell you is that Jesus is walking into that environment, your situation, and he's saying, "Mm -mm, nope, do not fear. Only believe. And he's walking straight through the chaos. And you know what? You can sometimes have really well-intentioned friends, people who are trying to encourage you, people who are trying to speak life over you, but they might encourage you to stop praying for the things you're praying for because they don't want you to be disappointed again. And their intentions might be great, but can I just tell you that the only person you need to listen to in that moment is the voice of your father? And I love that Jesus walks on the scene and he, he actually asks the people, why, why are you making this commotion? Like, why? Why are you crying and mourning? She's not dead. She's only sleeping. And they laugh at him. And some of you have that kind of audacious faith to believe that God is capable of doing the miraculous in your life. And people have scorned you, and people have laughed at you, and people have told you, I do not know what you're thinking. But Jesus himself walked into a moment of disbelief and said, oh, no, no, no. It is what it is, but it's not what it seems. And I just want to encourage you today that there's a miracle-working God who is with you in the journey that you're in that won't leave you, that won't forsake you. His promises over your life are good. You can trust him. And I believe that it's time to activate your faith again. So we're at the climax of the story. We're at the climax of the story. And in this moment, Jesus goes with Jairus. They push past the mourners. And could you just, for a moment, just put yourself in Jairus' shoes? Like, I just, I picture heart pumping. Like, just racing. Just trying to believe. Like, trying to convince himself to believe. He's with Jesus, but at the same time, like, the news that he's gotten is just absolutely unbearable. It's so painful. It's something he never wanted to face in his whole life. And he's trying to believe that something could be different, and he's walking with Jesus. But I just imagine this heart-racing, heart-pumping moment. You know what that feels like. Mark 5, verse 40 through 42 says this, Jesus put them all outside, all the mourners, all the people making all the commotion. And it says, he took the child's father and mother and those who were there with him, and he went to where the child was. And you know, again, I have a vivid imagination of the scripture, but I just like to picture it like this. Jesus has walked into the scene, and he walks into the mother, and he grabs her hand. Some of you as moms who've been praying for a child who's wandered far from God, feels like they're gone, that they're lost. All hope for you has just dwindled. But yet you know what it feels like to just grip the hand of Jesus. And I imagine Jesus takes hold of her hand, and he takes hold of the Father's hand, and he says, we're going into that room. We're going into that dark place. We're going into that place of disappointment. We're going into that place of fear, and they're walking together into that room. And can you just imagine what that would be like? They are literally holding the hand of hope. And sometimes that's all we've got, right? It's just a grip to the hand of hope. The fact that God is able to do the impossible. The fact that he is a miracle working God. The song we sang earlier, he's the same God now that he was then. We, we talk about the God of Abraham, the God of David, the God of Moses. We talk about the miracles that we read in the Bible, but yet we have to hold on so tight to believe that we ourselves could receive a miracle from God like they received back then. But here's the mother and the father, and they're holding on to the hand of hope, and they walk into that room. And it says this, 
Jesus, taking the little girl by her hand, said to her, Talitha kume, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately, the girl got up and she began walking for she was 12 years of age. Come on, that is worth a celebration. That's worth a celebration. Can I get the keys up here? I just, I feel like at the close of this conference, there's some of you in this room that need to hear those words, Talitha Kume. Little girl, I say to you, arise. You know, there's some of you in here that have been praying for and believing for a miracle, and you find yourself in the posture and the position of Jairus, the father. And, and you've come before Jesus with a hopeless situation, with something that feels unreal, unattainable. I don't know if it's financial. I don't know if it's your marriage. I don't know if you're believing for your kids. I don't know if you're praying for a baby and you just haven't seen it happen yet or praying and believing for a spouse. I don't know what the thing is that you've been wrestling with God about, that you've been settling for, that you've been going, I don't know. I don't know if I have enough faith to believe for this anymore. I don't know where you've been comparing your life to somebody else and watching the miraculous in other people's lives and yet questioning your own worth and value because you haven't experienced what you're praying for yet. And can I just tell you that I believe that I'm standing here today to encourage you to get your faith stirred up again. It is what it is, but it is not what it seems. God is working in your waiting. He's working on your behalf. You just don't know what he's doing yet. You can't see it yet. Hindsight is always 2020. When I look back on the story of my life, that's where I see the miraculous working hand of God. It's always hard to see it in the in front of me, but when I look back, that's where I see God's faithfulness. That's where I see his protection. That's where I see where he has guarded my heart in moments where I felt like I was being rejected in relationship, but yet God has been saying, no, 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 I'm going to protect you from something that's toxic. You don't need that in your life. I'm going to guard you and protect you. I don't see it when I'm looking forward, but I see it when I'm looking back. And some of you need to know that you're in the middle of the story. You're in the middle of the waiting. Do not fear. Only believe. God's with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's walking with you through the darkest moments you might be experiencing. And if there's one thing you take away this weekend, I hope you know that the presence of God goes with you wherever you go. He won't disappoint you, friend, I promise. But I also think there might be some women in this room who actually need the words of Jesus. Because maybe you showed up to this conference more in the position of the little girl. Something in you has died. You're sitting here physically, but Maybe it's a dream that has died, a relationship that's been lost. Maybe like we've talked about over the past few messages, maybe you've just settled and gotten comfortable and you're not, you're not living the life that God created you to live and you know it and you're, you feel this conviction, this stirring inside your spirit that there's something more, God, you have something more for me, but you're also kind of in this posture of like, what do I even do? And I just believe that Jesus is walking into the room today to say, Talitha Kume, little girl, I say to you, arise. I say to you, arise. It's time to rise and shine. I love the scripture says, that says, arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Hey, listen, some of you have stories like the stories that were shared today from the platform. You have stories of what God has done in your life. You have stories of where God has taken your brokenness, your helplessness, and he's made you whole again. But yet you've been paralyzed in this indecision this inability to get up and to do something. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's insecurity. I don't know what it is, but I'm here to tell you today, Talitha Kume, little girl, I say to you, arise. You have a story, you have a voice. It needs to be heard. We live in a world that is desperately in need of the hope that is found in Jesus. And it's gonna take 
some women to actually recognize that God has called me. He's anointed me. He's brought back to life some of the dreams that have been dead. And he's asking me to take some steps of faith into a brand new arena. Some of you need to be filled with boldness today for the call of God that is upon your life. You know what Jesus says to this little girl after he raises her from the dead? I love this. He says to the parents, give her something to eat. Like one of the greatest miracles in history has just taken place. Jesus has raised the dead. And he just looks at the parents and he says, give her something to eat. But I love this about Jesus. Because I think sometimes when we attend a conference like this, and God begins to stir in our hearts, and we feel him pulling us into something more, resurrecting some dreams, speaking life and purpose over us. Many of you have received a word from God this weekend. Maybe you've written it down somewhere. Maybe it's in your phone. Maybe you're just meditating on it. You've received a word from God. And I think sometimes in our own planning and in our own control issues, we think we've got to have this big picture of how it's all going to happen. But Jesus is so practical so simple. She's been lying there dead. She's got to be hungry. Give her something to eat. Give the girl something to eat. And can I just tell you, there's some practical next steps for you today. There's some practical next steps for you today. One we're going to take together in just a moment. In just a moment, I'm going to have us all stand and I want to pray over you if you feel like God is trying to awaken something new inside of you. If you want, maybe you just, maybe you feel like the little girl just lying dormant. You feel dead on the inside and you're just like, God, I want to know what your purpose is for my life. I want to know what the call of God is on my life. And and you find yourself in that posture. That may be you. And some of you actually have just settled on old dreams because you don't want to be disappointed. And you've prayed bold prayers before, but you don't want to pray them again. But yet you know that God has asked you to do something that you haven't yet been willing to do. And I believe that this is a moment where God's calling that dream back to life. And he wants to equip you with what the next steps look like. So in just a few moments, if that's you and that resonates with you, I'm going to have you come to the front. And I'm to pray a bold prayer of faith over you and commission you into the call that God has on your life because this is your next step. And some of you just need to get your faith stirred up again. Some of you just need to get your faith stirred up again. And we're going to pray for that today too, but can I do this? Can I just invite you to stand to your feet? talked about this in the beginning. Remember, there's a posture that says, God, I want it. If you have it, I want it. And I'm just going to encourage you to just posture your heart, your mind, your body like that right now. This is a word from heaven for you, Talitha Kume. Little girl, I say to you, arise. We're no longer living in the pain of your past. We're no longer living the victim story. Today is a brand new day filled with hope, filled with life, filled with destiny, filled with calling. I'm equipping you. I'm going to give you boldness. I'm going to give you a voice to tell your story. I'm going to bring people across your path that need to know about the goodness of the Lord. And you're going to share the hope that you found in Jesus. And their life is going to be radically changed because you're willing to step out into what God's asking you to do. So if you're here today and you're saying, God, here I am, send me. I want you to awaken that thing inside of me. I want to know what you've called me to do. If there's a dream that you've allowed to die and it's time for it to raise from the dead, I want each and every one of you as women that feel that in your heart to come up here to the altar because we're going to pray a prayer of faith over you today. Squeeze on in, ladies. And if you're here and you're walking in the call of God and you feel confident in that today, you can can pray for these girls.
to pray a prayer of faith over you today. And then I'm going to come down there and I'm going to put my hand on as many people as I can and just pray that a boldness, that life is coming into your soul again. That the Holy Spirit's going to fill you with fresh breath. That you're going to feel refreshed and renewed. That when you walk out of this room today, that you're going to walk out a new woman, a renewed woman who has a confidence in the call that God has on her life. I'm going to believe that as you walk out of this room this weekend, that there's going to be a strength that has come up in the inside of you. And you're going to know the peace of God like you've never known it before. When you go home, even if you're going back to the mess, back to the crisis, back to the stress, no matter what you face, you're going to be able to draw on the words do not fear only believe and you're going to learn what it looks like to get down on your knees to seek the face of God to say God I trust you you will not disappoint me you will not let me down because I am yours so God I lift up every single woman in this room right now God I declare God purpose and calling over her life God, in the name of Jesus, God, you see her. You know her story. God, you know exactly what she's been wrestling with. God, you know, Lord Jesus, the questions that she's been asking. God, for some of these women, you know the dreams that they've buried. God, the things that they haven't seen happen. God, words that were spoken over their life when they were little girls. God, prophetic words that they received in the church when they were growing up. And they questioned, but could that actually be? Talitha Kume, little girl, I say to you, arise. He's calling you up and out today, ladies. He's equipping you with a voice, with a boldness, with a confidence. You will share your story. You will talk about the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He is good and he is God and he is faithful and he will not fail you. For those that need their faith stirred up today, God, I thank you that you are raising our level of expectation today. I thank you that you are a miracle working God. I thank you that you are trustworthy. God, we lean into who you are today in the mighty name of Jesus. And God, I ask that you would speak to each and every woman right now. God, right now in the name of Jesus, let her hear your voice. Let her hear your voice. God, your word tells us that you're the good shepherd and we are your sheep and the sheep recognize and know your voice. So God, I thank you for the call that's on these ladies' lives. God, some of them are called to write their story There's somebody in this room that's called to write a book that's gonna tell the story of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Some of you are called to teach. Some of you are called to be a neighbor that pays attention to what's going on in the lives of those around you. You're the woman that's gonna show up. You might show up with cookies, you might just show up with a hug, but you're gonna show up for the person on your street the friend that you've made, that you're gonna just begin to show up in their life and to tell your story. And in that, I just believe, I believe there are some women in this room who have some people on your heart and you've been nervous about how to share your faith with them. You've been nervous about how to talk about Jesus and how to not make it weird. And I just believe that you're gonna leave here today empowered with boldness to share your story, to go and to invest into the lives of the people that are in your community. And here's what I feel like the Spirit of God is saying, because of your faithfulness, family trees are gonna be changed. Generations are gonna be changed. Young people are gonna come to know Jesus that would have never known Jesus if you hadn't been willing to share your story. Teenagers, young adults, I want you to look at me for a minute. Pastor Veronica prayed over you earlier. If you're 25 or under, I would just give me your eyes for a minute. It's time to be bold. It's time to know Jesus, to know him for yourself. You've got to lean in. Listen, there is no better way to know Jesus than to read his word. And maybe the Bible doesn't make sense to you yet. Hey, you grab my devotional. If you can't afford it, you come talk to me. We will figure it out because I will break down what scripture means for you. 
But listen, you've got to get in the Word of God because you've got to know Jesus. It can't just be an awesome message that you hear. It can't be an Instagram that you repost for somebody else. It's got to be right here where deep in your heart, you know Jesus. You know that He won't fail you. You know that He won't let you down. You know that when your heart is broken, when you're struggling at school, when you feel like you don't fit in, when you're overwhelmed because your friends are making stupid decisions and you're like, how can I have the courage to do what's right? When you don't know what to do and you sit in your room alone at night, the Spirit of God will give you the strength that you need to be the person He called you to be. Can I just tell you, there's so many people your age that desperately need to know the hope that's found in Jesus. And it's probably why God puts you in their life. Don't back down. Lean in. Get to know him. Be bold. You are called for such a time as this. You are called. You are equipped. You're ready. You might feel like you're not, but you're ready. You're ready. So can we just take one last moment together? And we're going to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Maybe just give him all the praise for what he's done in your life. Maybe some of you are still leaning in and listening to his voice. And he's, maybe God's just unpacking for some of you some steps to take. There's some next steps for every single one of us in this room. So what is that for you? But can we lean in and worship him? I believe as we worship him, as we exalt the name of Jesus in this place, for the few moments we have left together, I believe that God's just going to seal the work that he's done in all of our lives. So God, we give you the glory and the honor in the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.